Good evening and welcome, and uh, thanks for coming indoors on such a beautiful evening. Yeah, you guys can come up and take your seats if you'd like. My name is Lisa Servan. I am the Dean of Milano, the New School for Management and Urban Policy, and also the New School for General Studies. One of Milano's longstanding objectives has been and continues to be to prepare professionals who can analyze intricate health issues and evaluate existing and proposed policies. Over time, as many of you know, our health offerings have been developed for students interested in creative solutions to complex health problems like access to health care, financing health care, and the needs of special populations. Health and social policy is an arena in which many Milano alumni have played a very important role over the years. And in fact, to take just one example, when I became dean about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, one of my first meetings with, was with Lori Slutsky, who is an alum of our program and who's president of the New York Community Trust. The trust was one of the foundation community's earliest leaders on fighting HIV and AIDS. So interesting just thinking about the different ways in which you can have an impact on these fields. And during my time at Milano, I've come into contact with many other alumni as well who are doing incredibly impressive work in all three sectors, and in some cases in very senior positions in public policy, in organizations that advocate for consumers and other stakeholders, at foundations, at hospitals, clinics, and other care providers, at pharmaceutical companies and other for-profit parts of the industry and, and elsewhere. This evening is a special occasion because we're going to hear from four outstanding alumni of Milano who will share their perspectives on their fields and their work. They're going to talk about their careers, how they got to where they are now, what the key events were, and what decisions they made along the way. And I want to thank you all for joining us. This is a particularly timely discussion for a couple of reasons. One, of course, is the recent enactment of major health insurance reform legislation on the federal level. So I'm particularly lo looking forward to hearing our speakers' perspectives on today's political and economic environment and how it's impacting their field and their work in the job market. This conversation is also timely because Milano some months ago embarked on a process of integration with the Graduate Program in International Affairs, which began at the New School in 2001 and has always been a part of the New School for General Studies, the other division that I, that I am dean of. Um, but for those who don't already know, I'm pleased to announce that on July 1st, Milano and GPA will be one school, an integrated entity, and um, in many ways, we really followed our student, our student lead in making the decision to integrate. We saw our students on both sides of the aisle recognizing on the international side that they needed the policy and analytic and management skills to do their work well, and on the Milano side, really realizing that um, more and more, no matter what you did, you needed an awareness and an understanding of the global environment. At both GPIA and Milano, we see New York City as the ideal locale to explore linkages between the urban and the global, between the international and the domestic, and between management and policy. And so I'm also looking forward to learning from this evening's speakers about their experience in the local, domestic, and international arenas. And I'm looking forward to learning about the factors, both planned and unplanned, because we know that um, you can never completely plan your career or your life that have shaped your careers. Uh, on the one hand, preparation and the decisions we make are hugely important in anyone's career. And to take the most obvious example, one decision that everyone on the panel has made, and many of you in the audience, has been the decision to pursue a degree at Milano. And then, of course, there are the factors that we cannot control, the chances and coincidences that also influence the work that we do. For example, if we seize and capitalize on an unexpected oppor career opportunity, or if we find ourselves trying to advance our careers in the midst of a profound economic downturn, some, something that many of you may be familiar with or worried about as you're about to graduate. And then there are the choices that we make in terms of balancing work and life. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a total believer in seizing the opportunities that come along, and if I were to spend uh, time, which I won't spend tonight, telling you about the twists and turns in my own career paths, you'd probably be surprised. Um, not least of the, the, the many years I've spent waitressing in New York City restaurants. And I think it's affected the way that I'm able to run this school. <laughs> Leads to my uh, decisions to try to have good food at meals. We have a little bit here, but or at meetings. Um, another key element, I think, is our values. The ideas and the core beliefs that we bring to the table. And one of the values, I think, that unites so much 
of the Milano community and that's so central to our mission is a commitment to progress and change. In fact, when I came here as a faculty member in 2001, it was that sense of mission, of being part of a, a common purpose um, that really drew me here and that made me leave what many consider to be a better university by some standards because I really felt like I was at home here. And so I'm really looking forward to also learning about how our speakers have manifested this in their work, how they've walked the talk, as we like to say at Milano. Lifelong learning is one of the ideas and commitments that has animated the new school since its inception, and supporting our alumni is something that I can consider tremendously important as dean. Tonight's panel is one in a series of alumni fora that Milano is convening as a resource for both our alumni and our current students, and it's my hope that everyone here will come away having learned and gained some insight that you can use in your own work. And we also want this to be an opportunity to network with each other and to make some connections, so we'll leave some time for that at the end. And if this program whets your appetite, I believe this is the third or the fourth one that we've done this semester, um, I hope you'll return in the fall when we continue this series. It's been quite successful. So before we get started, let me say a few things uh, with respect to a couple of housekeeping items. First, each of you has on your chair uh, an alumni survey, so I'd like those of you who are in the audience to fill it out and hand it to a staff member. Do we need these guys to fill it out too? You can wait till the end. We probably don't know quite enough. Um, so we use these surveys to get a little bit of a sense of what you want to see us do for you. And it, you may or may not realize, but Milano, uh, not just Milano, but the new school as a university is pretty new in terms of its thinking about how to really connect its alumni, use its alumni to help feed current programs and new students. And so we, we have a long way to go, but this is one, one of our efforts. Second, each of you has an index card on your chairs, and you can use that to jot down questions that you may want to ask the panelists toward the ends. They'll be collected by a staff member and given to Nidhi Srinivas, our moderator. And finally, I wanted to let you know that we are taping this program so that it can be posted online. We're doing a lot of stuff now on our website with YouTube, and um, you, so if you're interested and you, there are things that you wished you could have come to and you weren't able to come to, you can go back and see the archives on YouTube. And now I'd like to turn you over to our moderator, Nidhi Srinivas. His biography, as well as those of all of the speakers, are in your program, so I won't recite his whole resume right now. It would take up the rest of our time. And besides, I'm guessing that many of you already know Nidhi um, because you've taken one of his classes or were a student here or are currently doing so, and if you haven't, you may choose to do so after tonight. I know that he was a draw for Yolanda to pay a return visit after six years um, after her graduation from Milano. So will you join me in welcoming and applauding Nitty and all four of our fabulous alumni speakers. I'd like to keep this part extremely short, which is probably a good idea for former students of mine. They know how long I can go on. Uh, health and policy are extremely important. They're important in a domestic sense and an international sense. Studies have shown that famine is reduced due to the policy that governments have, and on the other hand can be increased through the policies governments have. Studies have shown that infant mortality in, Bron in the Bronx can at times compare unfavorably to infant mortality in sub-Saharan Africa, and it has everything to do with city government and the choices it makes. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you here and to introduce these four extremely talented former students here at Milano. If you give me one moment, I'd like, to, I'd like to very briefly tell you a couple of housekeeping rules for this evening's session and then introduce the, uh, the four people. Uh, we're going to do speed networking, which means that I'm going to manage the time as quickly as I can and try to ensure that all of us have some time to hear each of the four people and to interact with them. That's, that's my role. So I'll begin by very briefly introducing them then request each one of them to make a brief opening statement, which can be on their work, and then I will facilitate questions from the audience and add some questions of my own. What I would request you to do is you'll find on your, on your chair an index card. Please keep that in index card handy. Write some questions down as each one of our participants speaks briefly. I'd like to begin by introducing Karen Ledlander, who graduated from Milano in 1999. She's a founding member of the Board of the Children's Health Fund and has served as its executive director since 2003. In this position, Ms. Redlander oversees the development of healthcare programs that help increase access to care for medically undeserved people in New York City and across the country. She's also responsible for the administrative and financial operations of the organization 
She also serves as an executive director of the Community Pediatric, Pediatric Program at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore and has oversight over its major pediatric healthcare programs. After that, excuse me. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce Adam. Um, you see, the reason I'm a little confused is because the names on the list are in a different order from the people speaking. Forgive me. Uh, I'd like to introduce Padmore John, who graduated from 2007 from Milano. I would occasionally see Padmore in the hallway, but he was clever enough to avoid my classes, and I have now cornered him up here on the panel. Padmore is a grants manager within the Healthcare Emergency, Emergency Preparedness Program of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where he oversees a $10 million grant that is awarded to all states and selected cities to improve emergency preparedness. I'd also like to introduce Adam Gurvich. I did see Adam in an event held when I first joined the New School many years back, and I recall his passionate views on immigration and on the healthcare uh, aspects for immigrants. He's currently the policy specialist for the National Immigration Law Center, where he focuses on policies and advocacy to preserve and expand immigrants' access to healthcare and insurance. Before joining the NILC in 2009, he was director of health advocacy at the New York Immigration Coalition, where he led legislative, civil rights, and policy advocacy campaigns to improve the social safety net and increase health insurance coverage. And finally, I would like to introduce Yolanda Caldera Duran, who graduated in 2004. And before introducing her, I'd like to acknowledge that Yolanda is a former student of mine and that we went to Montreal together uh, on a field trip as part of our class experience. Yolanda is currently at the Fairfield County Community Foundation, where she serves as its program director. In this position, she provides pre-application assistance to nonprofits, researches, and presents recommendations on grant requests, assists with evaluation, and assists with the design and implementation of strategic grant-making initiatives. So at this stage, I'm going to sit down and request each one of you to very briefly talk a little bit about the work you do. And in the meantime, I'd request everyone with the index cards to start writing down some questions you'd like to pose. Yolanda, would you like to start? Sure. Good evening. I'd like to thank Dean Servan uh, and uh, Nidhi um, for being here tonight, for inviting me to come out tonight. As Nidhi said, I'm program director at the Fairfield County Community Foundation, which is located in Norwalk, Connecticut. And I've been with the foundation for almost six years. I started as program officer and after two years was promoted to program director. And I'm responsible for overseeing a grants portfolio of over one and a half million dollars. Uh, and I work with nonprofit organizations that specialize in the areas of economic opportunity, health and human services. And I also uh, oversee some uh, grants in nonprofit capacity building. And those are grants that help to strengthen the management and oversight of nonprofit organizations in our region. Uh, the Fairfield County Community Foundation covers a 23 town area of southwestern Connecticut. And there are four major urban areas in Fairfield County, and there are a lot of suburbs. And there's a significant disparity in, between wealth and poverty in Fairfield County, and that is why um, the role of the Community Foundation is so important in helping to strengthen um, that part of our state. I, I was interested, became interested in philanthropy because of, uh, because of this program, the Nonprofit Management Program, and a course that I took that was led by Dr. Aida Rodriguez on philanthropy uh, in the, I, think, I believe it was philanthropy in the 21st century. And I never considered this as a career for myself, but after taking that class and learning more about foundations, how they operate, how they can be agents of social change, this became something of great interest to me. Glad to be here tonight. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm Adam Gervich. I'm a policy specialist at the National Immigration Law Center. It's a national nonprofit. Um, it's uh, based in Los Angeles. It has offices in Washington, DC. I work out of my home here in New York City. I've been with NILC for the last year. I've worked primarily on the national health care reform effort, um, a combination of communications and messaging work, uh, direct lobbying of the legislators and staffers who are developing um, the new law, 
and, um, and all sorts of other assorted activities around trying to uh, organize support for immigrant inclusion and health reform. This week we're working on immigration reform. Um, it's six o'clock, so that means there's a press conference in Washington, D.C. where senators are introducing their draft framework for immigration reform. I spent this week working on um, issues around immigrants' access to public benefits in immigration reform. And it, it's a departure from what I had been doing previously in that I, I'm currently focused very much on policy. It's a more analytical, um, I'm not a lawyer, but it's dealing a lot more with uh, the actual construction of laws and regulations. And um, previously, I'd spent eight years at the New York Immigration Coalition. Hi, Eugene. Um, one of my former colleagues is here. And um, there I started a, a health access program and directed an immigrant access to healthcare collaborative and, and did a lot of work at the local, state, and as well as federal level on, um, on changing the laws uh, through a whole range of of strategies from civil rights complaints to um, helping to draft legislation and try to move it um, to passage to uh, media work and, and so forth. So that's a bit about my background um, since leaving Milano in 2000. Um, prior to joining Milano, I had worked for a number of years after college. I had uh, done HIV prevention work um, starting in 1989, so I've been doing nonprofit work for 20 years now. It's, <laughs> it's probably time I find a job with a living wage. And, um, and had, had, um, had gone into Peace Corps from 1994 to 96 and stayed an extra year in Hungary working on HIV prevention programs before moving to New York and, um, and working and going to grad school. So that's, I think, a overview of my background. Thank you very much. Good evening all. Uh, thank you, especially Carol, for the invite. Um, always good to see Carol. I appreciate her being sitting in contact. Um, as you, find, you guys will learn a little bit later, she was influential in helping me make a transition that was that came at a difficult time. So I always owe her, and I think she's always going to have that over me. Um, <laughs> Um, I work uh, for the New York City Department of Health, specifically in the Healthcare Emergency Preparedness Program. Um, it began, it was a program that was funded shortly after the 2001, um, the 9-11 event. It is given to all the states um, uh, in the union. New York City and Chicago and LA has their, because of their population, are able to get funding directly. Um, so they're in a kind of special um, position. Basically what we do is that we provide health, um, emergency preparedness work for all the hospitals. Um, I know when the, pro when the program initially began in New York City, there were 73 or 70, between 70, 73 and 75 hospitals. We're down to 62 now with the closing of St. Vincent's. Um, so we are having constantly losing beds over that period of time. Um, basically, it is to try and get all hospitals on a standardized level um, in terms of emergency preparedness. Uh, as everyone knows, when 9-11 when, um, occurred, there was a lot of, um, there wasn't much of, much of coordination in terms of responses, much of coordination um, in terms of where people can be taken to which hospitals. And so now we have really, one of the things that we've developed is in all of the hospitals in New York City there, each of them have an emergency preparedness plan to be able to meet an, a, a variety of, of, of natural, uh, natural and, and um, unnatural disasters. Recently, um, we have also began making this that a foray into community health centers, long-term care facilities, um, and most just shortly, um, and I'll give you a little background to this, we started going to private, um, private care providers. That's important because private care providers, all, they make up a very large population of, of visits and actually the number of physicians in the city. But yet so, they were not at all integrated within the New York City, Depart um, New York City any of New York City's um, emergency preparedness plans. And that came into, that came into vivid, um, um, 
It was badly brought to our, to our attention, actually, during the outbreak of H1N1, where we were, H1N1 kind of happened in, in two waves. And the initial wave was in the spring of, um, spring of what, 09. And what happened there, it co took everyone by, by surprise. So we were really scrambling in terms of being able to provide adequate care and, and adequate preparation for all the hospitals, for the people that were, um, they're expected to see. Hospitals were taken care of. A lot of people that were walking in, they didn't know what was happening. They were basic, as you guys all know, they were overwhelming the EDs, the emergency um, departments. And that caused a great backup. There was a lot of issues about, you know, hospitals were staffing. They weren't able to meet the, um, the pressure that was coming from that. And so part of the second wave or the preparation for the fall was to try and get a lot of folks who were not sick and did not need to go to the ED to go to their primary care providers. But we had no way of telling that really to the primary care providers to get prepared. So one of the, um, although mainly I'm on the finance end, I actually started up a program basically where we were initiating a, um, a, a campaign to get our, all of our primary care providers on the same level as some of our hospitals, as some of our health centers. And so that's an ongoing campaign, and I know that will be greatly affected by the recent passing of the, of the health care bill because there's a focus on primary care within that bill. Um, that will be talked about a little bit later. Uh, so right now, we're, it's a hectic time for us because as it's that time for grants and writing budgets and preparing for all of that. So um, Karen, I know it was a last minute for me to be able to say yes, I could make it, but as she knows, I always do it for her and happy to be here. <laughs> thank you very much, Pamela. Karen. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here to share some of my experiences with you. and. Very interesting to hear from the other panelists um, about their work. So, you know, I've been working in healthcare for almost 40 years, actually. And, you know, trying to figure out how to narrow what I say and what I share with you and, and, and what would be interesting to you has sort of been an interesting process. But, um, You know, one, a couple things I'd like to just convey at the beginning, and then, of course, there'll be questions. But I, I think healthcare is, is an incredibly um, wonderful field to work in, in general. Um, it's important. People, um, we all have experiences with the healthcare system. We know what it's like to have an experience that doesn't work well. Um, as managers in a healthcare environment, you have an opportunity to make a big difference in the quality of care and the effectiveness of care and, and the experience of healthcare, e even if you're not a direct clinician and having you know, patient interaction. So for me, I, I, I feel very privileged that I kind of fell into healthcare uh, as, a, as a career. I, I didn't, when I graduated from college, um, I really didn't know, I had no clue what I wanted to do, really. Um, it was in the 70s. You know, we, I was a baby boomer generation. We were pretty cynical about all institutions, and, you know, it was hard to know who, who, who you would want to kind of connect with. I was a sociology major because I care about human services and I care about helping, you know, make a difference in, in our world. But I wasn't sure which, which way to go. Um, so I ended up joining VISTA, which is like a domestic Peace Corps. Um, and I also had reservations about that, you know, because I didn't want to be paternalistic. I didn't want to have, you know, feel like, you know, I wasn't doing something of real service in a community, in a partnership with people. But I, I sort of spoke to a recruiter, and, and they convinced me that it, I could actually you know, help people in some way. So, to make a long story short, I ended up going to a small community health center in rural Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from California. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I found out that's where I was going, I really had to look on a map. <laughs> because it, it, it really was a part of the country that I'd never paid attention to too much. But that's what started my path in healthcare. I, I, I went there because the, 
the process that you, you know, went through at that time. And there is a program similar to VISTA now. It's called AmeriCorps. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, but they matched up people's background or education with the type of opportunity in different community-based programs. And what, the, what this health center needed was somebody to help develop a social service program as part of the range of services in, in that center. And they figured, well, sociology major, social work, close enough. So I, I had an incredible opportunity in this very small town, very poor community, the sixth poorest county in the nation, it was told. Um, I had this opportunity to develop a program all by myself. You know, nobody to help me, nobody, no professionals around, no particular roadmap, but a great opportunity um, to say, you know, well, what would be good for this, this, this program? and these patients, and this environment, this community. And that was an incredible experience for me. It was very satisfying. It, I met a lot of great people in the community, ended up staying there for two years, and really got my foot in the door in healthcare, and realized that it was a, it was a wonderful environment, and there were lots of different ways to go in healthcare. You know, you can do program development, administration, finance, emergency preparedness, um, inpatient, outpatient, billing, you know, just social services, nursing, there's just a great range of things that you can get involved with. Eight, you, it could be age related. Um, you know, I had an interest in working with kids and so I sort of kept that in my career um, and ended up working with the Head Start program and mental health services and other community-based health centers. Um, and got a, lo a lot of different experiences, uh, which I think is good in, an, in a career, to uh, take opportunities that give you a range of experiences. I, I think that's helpful as you move mm -hmm. through your career choices. Um, you never know exactly how they'll come and weave together <laughs> in the next stage, but I found that um, it was very beneficial to have this range of services, because as I got more responsibility and went up the ladder, I could really sympathize, <laughs> empathize, understand a, a, a number of different perspectives, whether it's from the clinical perspective, the IT perspective, the policy perspective, the conflicts among those different factions in the healthcare world. Um, but the, I, I guess the, the, but the uh, sort of, uh, you know, kind of, critical experience that, that got me to where I am today happened in the mid 80s and that is, um, you know, it's, it's a unique experience because my husband and I uh, worked together. We actually met in Arkansas, he's a pediatrician and I became kind of a health, health administration, health management. We were very complimentary in our skills um, and he, I was, going to school to get a master's degree, raising kids. He was in a job where he had the opportunity to meet Paul Simon, the singer. <laughs> he was interested in the homeless in New York City. Uh, Paul was, and Erwin, my husband, was working for USA for Africa at that time, um, trying to spend the money that was raised for, uh, through the record, We Are the World. Some of you Older folks might remember that. <laughs> um, anyway, um, Paul Simon was interested in whether or not some of the funds could go to New York City, not, not only to Ethiopia, but to New York City, and that was possible. And so he met my husband, and, and they went on this very important tour of, of welfare hotels here in New York City. And some of you may remember in the mid-'80s, you know, the homelessness, there were lots of homeless individuals and even families on the streets. It was a burgeoning population. There were terrible welfare hotels here in Midtown Manhattan and all around the city, decrepit third world mm -hmm. conditions that families were living in. And it was very, very impactful to them um, to see that, to see that uh, you know the Martinique Hotel, which is on 34th Street, had uh, 400 families who were homeless and had been living there for 18 to 24 months. Get one meal a day, not going to school. The kids were not going to school. They weren't getting health care. It was just, you know, 
horrible, so, and very motivating to try to do something to help it. So he basically um, came home and said, you know, I have this idea, I want to do a healthcare program, uh, a mobile program, doctor's office on wheels and bring to welfare hotels so kids can have care. And she's a kid, could you just make that happen? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, you know, we had worked together in uh, all these unusual environments over the years and I said, you know, absolutely. So I then began to put together a program to um, actually bring health care to kids in homeless shelters using a mobile model, kind of a, a custom designed recreational vehicle, doctor's office on wheels. So that became our, our, our way of bringing health care to the most medically underserved child populations that we could identify. And um, because access to care was very difficult for the medically underserved populations, for homeless families and others. And uh, so through that, we developed, we established an organization called the Children's Health Fund. It's nonprofit organization to help develop healthcare programs for medically underserved children using this model, this mobile model, to reach very hard to reach populations, whether it's in urban communities, um, like here in New York City, or rural communities across the country serving small towns where there are no doctors, that type of thing. Fast forward, it's an organization that's been around for 23 years. Um, my original job was to focus on the New York program. So as an executive director, administrator, to grow the New York flagship programs. And then um, the last six years, I've been executive director of the national organization, the Children's Health Fund. And that uh, is more of a national focus on uh, you know, the, the, the bigger picture, not so much health administration, but um, fundraising, communications, policy, program development. Uh, so I have a lot of different experiences I'm happy to share with people. Um, and um, I turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, there are lots of questions that occur to me, so I'm going to start with the first one and not put these in any order, but I'm looking at the audience and I recognize that there, there, there are many people here who, who are looking at the four of you for advice on career trajectories. And one way of framing this would be to say, how did you get to where you are? Now, Karen, you actually answered a little bit of that. And as I heard your answer, I was really struck by, you sort of give us the impression that it happened almost by fortune or by luck, but it, nothing ever happens only by luck. And of course, luck does play a part. So my question, start with, starting with you, is really this. What is the advice you'd give to people in the audience on, on what, 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 is, what should they be doing to help them stay ready for opportunities of jobs that are out there? Well, I, I think it's important to keep your, um, to be open to explore a range of experiences, to not be too narrow in what you think of as the right type of job or the important type of job or, you know, the best type of job. Um, I, I think that you never know exactly what can come out of an experience, a, you know, somebody that you might meet, um, hearing more about your you know, so, some individual programs. And I think it's really important to do what you love. I, I do. I'm still that ty type of idealist. And I know sometimes it's not practical. And I, my kids are, you know, going through different challenges in this job market and all that. But, and sometimes you have to take a job that's not perfect. And, you know, it might be an interim arrangement, but you keep your eyes open for something else. But, you know, I feel very, very privileged to have worked in a field that I love. And so to me, I don't feel like I'm working mostly. You know, I, I just um, enjoy so much what I do. I enjoy the people I work with. I, 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 um, I feel like I'm contributing in some kind of way. And I help other people contribute in their ways too. So um, I, I think that's one, one thing is to, you know, you know it's when you're young, you sort of do that naturally because you don't really know exactly what you're doing. And you, you know, you try different things. And, you know, so that's what happened to me. I knew I wanted to work in human services. I, I, I you know, and I thought this was a, 
ended up being an, a great experience to go into VISTA, and then things happened from that. Um, but I think it can happen all along the way. I mean, I, I had also worked in, in the private uh, side of healthcare for five years, and that helped me under, you know, from a different perspective when I ended up going back into the foundation, you know, with working in the foundation and, and more a public uh, side of healthcare. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's one thing, is to do, do, do what you love and to keep open and, and flexible with, with possible opportunities that might come your way. Thank you very much. Uh, Padmore, you sort of hinted rather coyly at the fact that Carol Anderson has been very helpful to you and that's, that's helped bring you back here. So I'd frame the same question to you, but in a slightly different way. Could you talk a little bit about what led you to being in disaster preparedness in, in, in the way you are now? And what that helps you then think of as some skills or, or, or ways of practice that students should be sensitive to? Sure. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, the way I got into disaster preparedness is completely by luck. <laughs> I don't want to, sorry for using that word. Um, in the sense that, you know, I, actually there are a few things that kind of led me in that direction. When I was at Milano, um, and this is it, right, um, just after Katrina had struck, mm -hmm. Um, one of the, I was developing a relationship with a um, CBO, community-based organization, not too far from where I was at the time. And I wanted to um, put together something for my PDR. And I, I felt, kind of, what I took from what happened in, um, in New Orleans was that it, it's, it, it, it is it's required for um, sort of, for people in whatever situation they may be, to not have to be dependent on any governmental agency, really, to be able to take care of themselves, and especially for preparation for any type of disaster. And so I had developed a relationship with that community-based organization, and I wanted to see what, where they were and how some of the, some, what I was um, seeing from what happened in Katrina, I could take to that, um, to there. So I actually approached them and asked, you know, is, you know, for for my PDR, would it be able for that be okay for me to actually, you know, see um, the way you operate? Um, what there are some in gaps you may have in terms of um, emergency preparedness, and um, you know, what possibly could get out of that? I mean, they're a nonprofit organization. Here was this guy who was going to do some stuff for them for free. You know, they were not going to say no. Um, and that's basically what I did. It, and the, the organization was pretty interesting in that it, 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 it um, was a social service organization uh, specifically around substance abuse, mm -hmm. um, but they also had housing, and it was relatively large, and dive, um, um, they were in a, a variety of areas. And so the organization was... Um, well placed to be able to take care and provide a lot of services to the people that it provided the ser um, services for, but they didn't have the expertise and didn't necessarily see it as a need to build up any type of emergency preparedness. And that's what that's an issue that you know I'm seeing right now. Um, you know, for emergency preparedness, it just has to be part of your your mo. Um, you know, business continuity. You know. Anything could happen. You could lose power, a snowstorm, whatever. If you're a business, especially in the healthcare um, field, and you know, f hospital, whatever, small, um, a small private provider, that's your bread and butter. If you can't see patients, you can't bill. You know, so you have to be able to um, to address that issue and have the business continuity. So from that, you know, I I approached, they accepted, I brought something um, to them, and it, it was something that they were able to implement to some extent. That organization, shortly thereafter, they um, got uh, they well, it was an umbrella organization, and one of the, the, the um, organizations underneath them was a, a family health center that they recently opened. Mm -hmm. This relationship I had developed with them through doing the emergency preparedness um, and gap analysis, they asked me to come on as its uh, administrative director. 
So I was there for a couple of years and cut my teeth on that. And you know, I felt like it was shortly after I it was shortly before I graduated actually from Milano. Mm -hmm. And so it was, well, I feel like a lieutenant that came out of um, you know, <laughs> of the army school and they just threw you there, they give you your, you know, a sergeant, a couple of um, people and you you know, because it was new. We had to get our funding. We had we had you know no federal funding. The way health centers operate is on um, being as an FQHC, federally qualified health center. That was not there, and so we were you know just hanging by a scrape of our teeth. But we had to bring different funding from different agencies. Um, we did, we got, got different um, um, put in some grants that came through. Uh, developed relationships with some people in the in the um, in the uh, in the community that develop political um, um, partnerships as well, and that all helped us to get, to get some money. And so around emergency preparedness, you, know, you see the need to integrate that within the, the normal business operations. Mm -hmm. And that's something I continue to um, always look to have in, 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 in my different cap um, capabilities. So long story short, at some point, I, you know, see, we were, my CEO and I were just not seeing eye to eye in, in terms of where this organization could go. And I'd already developed a relationship with the Department of Health from an internship that I had here. Um, I was able to make contacts with folks through this internship, and that's something I want to talk about in terms of opportunities as well. You know, an internship wasn't a great, I mean, I was getting paid. It was, you know, you can get internships and you don't get any money. Um, I was appreciated when I was getting something. It wasn't that much. But, and it was also in a field that had nothing to do with emergency preparedness, but it actually, um, let me just put it like this. The field was in the primary care information project, which is electronic health records. And that's going to be humongous um, in the next, well, it is humongous right now. It's going to be even more humongous in a few couple, couple of years because there had been a large appropriation of money for that in the health bill. So if anyone is interested in that, that should be something that they should be considering. And actually, there's a lot of open positions in the part inside the Department of Health for that as well. So um, I did an internship there. And going back, when I, as, I, as I mentioned, in terms of getting a lot of the primary care providers to get in on starting to address emergency preparedness, the internship, the um, organization I did the internship with was that same organization I reached out to all these primary care providers through because they already developed a relationship. Right now, the New York City Department of Health has what it, the clinical works in electronic health records in over a thousand primary, primary, private primary care providers. And so that relationship that they had with all these primary care providers, I was like, you know, I already, I knew them, I worked with them, I said, listen, can I get in on your newsletter? Can I use some of your contact list so I can get this information out to them? Sure. So we were able to get that information out there. So it's really developing relationships and, you know, you never know what, I never knew it. that was gonna turn out like that. But I followed something, I was like, heck, I need to get some type of experience. Um, my previous life, I was a researcher. I, I never had the management, the, the program management, the finance relationship that I really, um, that I had. So I wanted to go out and branch into something else. And it was relationships that I developed and it eventually led me to where I am. But a lot of the skills that I, I, um, I, I, I amassed at the health center and doing the internship, I'm using them today. And I was actually speaking to Karen and said that they're not teaching, um, um, health finance anymore, and I, I think that's, that should come back, because I think everywhere we go, you need to have a basic economic background and know how to handle, ma manage money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever position you are, you need to know how to ma handle money. So I, that's, that's my little spiel for the um, health. <laughs> Joel Whitman was great, so I, Professor Whitman, so I have to say that to him. Fatmore, very quickly, uh, you, you, you mentioned many things, but is there one specific thing that you haven't mentioned yet that you think students in this room should know about helping them prepare themselves for a job market? Um, yeah, I, I really don't think you should necessarily, you know, I think it was said earlier, don't look down on any, any particular position. Um, first of all, it's, you know, and I'm gonna tie that back to some of the things that I, I I saw when I was here initially, my first semester at Milano, 
there were a lot of students that um, in a couple classes with me, and they were very upset because they felt that the professor was not teaching them correctly or not teaching them enough. I wasn't like that. I was like, well, I think it's up on you to try and get as much as possible from what is being given. And I mean, professor's a professor, you know, you're not going to say, okay, I'm not good in this class and make that be a, um, a barrier to when, I, when you leave to not have enough knowledge about going through a semester of this class. You have to take it out. And so what I would suggest is that at any position, you can see the ability for you to really gain experience. Um, you, know, you know, when I began, I, I remember I was sitting in the hallway as an intern in the Department of Health. And I just wanted, you know, they were asking me to do a few different things, do some research. So I would go into the research and I'd bring back a lot more than was expected because I wanted to know more about the, um, the issue myself. And so with that drive, you know, you really have to take it upon yourself to push yourself. No one is going to push you. Um, there may be great professors, inspire you, but, you know, you really, it's your will. And so I really would suggest that, you know, any little thing that you, you see an opportunity, take advantage of it. And, you know, I think that the more you give into that opportunity, the more you're going to get back. Thank you very much, Pat Moore. Uh, Adam, the common thread I hear, one of the common threads in the two, two, two people who just spoken, Karen and Pat Moore, is sort of a tremendous sense of passion and commitment to a field. Um, now, it's sort of obvious to me how committed and passionate you are about uh, issues to do with immigrant rights. But I'm curious what led to it. And it's a question I would pose to both of the people who just spoken, but since you're the third person, I thought I'd start with you. And you know, if you could use that as an occasion to also reflect on something you'd like to leave people with here in terms of skills or sensitivity that would help them look towards the job market in a new way. So I have a personal connection to, um, to the work that I do in that uh, I went and lived in Hungary and had permission to be there, but after my Peace Corps term was up, I wanted to stay longer and, and was fortunate in that I had some foundation support to do that, but was faced with the circumstance of um, needing national identity card or foreign visitor card, be, you know, in that, in that environment. Um, you would be standing by a train station and it was fairly obvious that I wasn't a Hungarian national and, you know, like the guard with a machine gun would come up and ask for my papers. And so I, I was faced with a, with a decision point about whether I wanted to stay in Hungary and at that time I had fallen in love and, you know, really was interested in, um, in connecting with people I'd met there and continuing the work I'd been doing and was faced with the prospect of um, figuring out how to do that either lawfully or, or as an um, individual residing in Hungary without permission. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to the States, um, I, brought, I brought that family with me and went, worked with them through their immigration process, my wife and son. And that was very convoluted and difficult. Um, it was at a time when immigration services uh, was at its most dysfunctional and, and frankly really abusive. And so. I, I personally spent many days outside of um, Federal Plaza on Broadway, um, standing all day in the snow while the sh sheltering tent next to us was locked. You know, and just the, the idea of um, our, checks were, our checks were accepted and canceled, but the claim was that our application that the checks had been stapled to had been lost. <laughs> and so, so for me, there, there was a lot of, um, you know, just a, a lot of sensitivity to what people were going through. I also moved to New York and, and uh, moved to Queens. And, you know, we were in, in a building with 10 families, uh, all of whom were foreign born. Um, and so could see, you know, the kids that my son was playing with ended up going um, back to Mexico. They had come here when, when he was four months old, had never lived in Mexico. But when it came time to go to high school, was shipped off to go back to Mexico. And so I, I just felt like there were, you know, there were some really profound um, issues that I could connect to on a personal level. And, um, and then there's, you know, I think other, the other folks who've spoken have talked about th this, um, how you 
get to where you're going, and sometimes I feel a little bit like a leaf in the wind. Um, <laughs> but I, I was here at Milano and had the good fortune of, of having uh, a chance to do a fellowship at the Center for New York City Affairs, and they had uh, been working on a conference around immigrant youth in the city. And so I was tasked with doing research on mental health access for immigrants in New York City, for kids in particular, and I really was fascinated by the subject and, um, and dove right in. And my approach um, to taking on that research task was to talk to as many organizations as I could um, about what their firsthand experience was. And so I, I had the chance to get some familiarity with the way that the field is arrayed. And as I finished that assignment, there was a job posted in, you know, um, idealist or wherever mm -hmm. uh, for an organization that was looking to start a program around immigrants and health access and so it was a good fit um, it was a good fit in terms of my skill set it was something I really cared about and and connected to personally and um, I was well prepared by Milano to you know to kind of step into that um, that environment so that's I think the, the first part of the question and then the second around what people can look what so what would sort of advice would you give people in terms of looking for jobs what in terms of your own experience right now i mean i think it's we're all different some people are much more directed and ambitious mm -hmm. some people are more um more able to be content um doing something over you know a, a long duration of time and other people just kind of burn at, at a certain point I have some internal clock, I guess, that just strikes and says it's time to look for the next challenge. So I think everyone's really different, and that makes it hard to give a, a general suggestions. But I agree with speakers who are talking about being flexible and keeping your eyes open to opportunity. I mean, I had, I had studied finance, um, investments, and banking, and marketing as an undergraduate. And I, I went out after college and worked for five weeks in that field and quit. Um, and was, was working in um, you know, retail and restaurants and as a courier and just doing all sorts of pretty random um, jobs, which, were, which was really hard work and not necessarily um, didn't leave me feeling very rewarded. And I, I was working at a bookstore and a coworker had, had um, she was taking time off from getting a PhD in psychology. And because I had studied what I had studied at the school I had gone to, I had a really strong grounding in statistics, and she was working on her dissertation and needed help on some statistical modeling. And because I was familiar and was happy to help, it became evident to her that I knew something about that topic. And she, um, in short order, got uh, brought in to do program evaluation on a national AIDS education program. And she suggested that I apply when they had an opening because she knew she, she knew me personally, so networking is really important. Um, but she also knew that I had some basis for doing the work. So that's how I got started in nonprofit. And then from there, it's gone from the more random to the more particular in that I think most of the opportunities have come from um, doing work and people becoming familiar with me. And when, I, when they have openings or opportunities, there's, there's some basis for the connection. So it's become a little bit more um, you know, of the, I guess, conventional network. Thank you very much, Adam. Yolanda, uh, yes. my, my question to you is obviously very similar, but I'm going to frame it slightly differently. What's the journey you've gone through after you left Milano, after you finished at Milano, and how has that journey led you to where you are right now? So after leaving Milano, I was um, actually right before the last year of my graduate program, I decided to leave my full-time job at the Salvation Army of Greater New York, where I was a senior grant writer. And uh, there were a few reasons for that. I really wanted to focus and finish the nonprofit management program. I had been in the program part-time, and I was getting really anxious, and I wanted to finish. I'm sure many of you can relate to that feeling. Um, so that, that was one of the precipitating uh, factors. The other uh, reason was because um, while I was a Brooklyn resident um, for several years, I wanted to return to Connecticut um, with my husband and, um, and get closer and be closer to my family. So, so that, just a little background, but um, so I finished um, 
I finished the program in 2004 and uh, took nine courses over two semesters and was, um, you know, really wanting to take on new challenges, um, but I also needed to pay the bills. So I was connected to this organization uh, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's called Aspira of Connecticut, and it's a Latino youth development organization. And I was hired as a grant writing consultant. Um, so it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Um, I did have knowledge and, and, and was successful at grant writing, was able to get funding for this organization. But um, my, my boss at Aspira, the executive director there, um, you know, she knew that I finished graduate school. She knew I had my master's in nonprofit management. And she said, oh, did you hear that the uh, Fairfield County Community Foundation is looking for a program officer? And, uh, you know, they could really pay you well there. They can give you a benefits package that I cannot. Um, so she was looking at the practical side. She said, I know, you know, you and your husband, you have big plans for your future, so you should really look into this. So uh, interestingly enough, I had actually had researched the Fairfield County Community Foundation um, before finishing um, the graduate program here. And, uh, and I saw a picture of their staff, and there wasn't any um, diversity on that staff. And I'm uh, of Puerto Rican descent. Um, and Fairfield County is a very diverse area, um, you know, and Bridgeport, for example, has about 40 percent uh, population that's, that's Latino. So I thought, okay, I'm going to walk in there, I'm going to somehow get in there and, and work for them, and, and I want to be able to, um, you know, to have an impact on, um, on their grant making. So this opportunity appeared, and I applied for the job, and you know, as far as, you know, what do you need to get into a place like that, the fact that the executive director of Aspida um, had a connection already with the Fairfield County Community Foundation, they actually funded my position there. So there was this natural connection. Um, so the, the relationship piece is, I, I, can't, um, I can't overstate it, it's really important. The economy was great when I graduated. The economy is really bad now. Um, and I, and I, I know it's going to be coming back. I'm not sure when. And I know the recovery will be slow. It will be a different place. Um, it'll be a different economy than it was before the economic um, recession. So, you know, I think um, to, to really have an opportunity, you really need to stay connected to the people that are important in your life, your mentors, your professors people who are working at places where you're interested in working, you really have to nurture those relationships. And I feel that um, because I nurtured that relationship um, with um, the executive director at the nonprofit where I worked, that was really significant. And when I came in for the interview, um, they, they just, the foundation just felt like, okay, well, you worked for Alma, so, so you must be all right because, you know, she's a great lady and she does great work at her organization. <laughs> So that was really helpful. Um, and it did not hurt to have a master's degree in nonprofit management. <laughs> because the, the job description and the job posting, you know, they were looking for somebody with a bachelor's degree and, you know, some knowledge of, of nonprofits. And I'd been working in nonprofits all my professional life, and I had a master's degree, and I was bilingual, and I was Latina. So all that worked in my favor. So um, so again, I just think relationships are really important, and I agree with um, with the other panelists uh, when they say that you know don't ever look down at a job. Um, you know, a ten hour a week consulting gig at a small nonprofit organization led to a really significant professional change in my life, um, and I'm working in a field that I'm very passionate about. I'm very excited to be a part of, and know that you know as far as philanthropy that we are not yet working at our fullest potential. So I see a lot of professional growth there for myself. Um, and, you know, and when I graduated um, with my sociology um, bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut, I didn't even know what a foundation was. So you just, <laughs> you never know where, um, where your life will take you. And, and just always be open to new opportunities and, and be open to, you know, networking. It's really important. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Uh, I, I just want to signal a couple of uh, I'll just make a couple of quick observations about the four people who just spoke, and you'll notice that all of them have emphasized the following things in different ways. You can never really plan for the unexpected. There's a lot of chance 
in uh, finding jobs, finding uh, the kinds of careers that, that all of us find. Second, there is a great emphasis on passion, but it's a specific understanding of passion. It's not passion based in sort of emotional intensity as much as personal satisfaction. And the satisfaction found in a kind of activity that you feel is very meaningful, whether it's the activity of uh, working with communities after Katrina, the activity of counseling different types of people in Arkansas, or in different ways working with communities and their needs in, in, in very, very specific senses. But adding to this is also a strange notion of skills, which is strange for me as a faculty member to tell you. There's an element of skills, which I hate to say it, but which I just can't provide and no faculty member can. Uh, we can give a foundation, and, and I really like to hope we do that well. But that foundation has to equip people then to get experience and exposure in different ways in what, what they care about and to understand what they care about very specifically. And the final thing, as, as Yolanda reminded us, among others, is, is the personal relationships. And recognizing that personal relationships are built. They're not, they're not about just exchange of visiting cards, though that does help. And they're not about um, Facebook uh, sites, which I've been reproached I don't respond to. <laughs> though those do help. They are about knowing the right people to meet because you feel you have a connection, because you have a set of experiences that you can learn from and that you can share and that'll stay with you. Now having said that, I'd like to turn to some questions. These are very, very interesting and important questions, so you'll pardon me if I just read one of them out and then ask each of you to respond. For interest of time, may I request you to not take more than five minutes? No, actually, no, I can't even do that. I'm very bad with maths. Take as little time as you can, but I will not interrupt you. I will not interrupt you because we have lots of interesting questions. We have about half an hour, that's why. Uh, the first question, as I think all of you have sensed, is what is your personal opinion of the recent federal health insurance reform? Are there opportunities here to be a change agent to make health care more just and more equitable in the private sector? Yolanda, would you like to start? Sure, at the far end. Yes. Uh, I'm amazed that the federal health care reform passed, and I'm really excited about it. Um, I think there are really significant opportunities um, to really improve community-based health care, and that's an area where the Fairfield County Community Foundation uh, is a big supporter of, um, and also uh, oral health, mental health services. What I think is um, worrisome uh, is the fact that so many people don't know what the new bill includes, and I think there needs to be a really significant effort um, on the part of the um, Obama administration to educate every single citizen about the new health care reform bill um, so that we understand exactly what's happened, how it's going to affect people who currently have insurance, people who are currently underinsured, and people who are uninsured. Um, so that, that's just something that we shouldn't be confused about. We should understand everything that's coming down the pike um, when, it, when it relates to that so that we understand how it's go going to affect our country and, and us um, as individuals. Thank you. So opportunities, absolutely. There's um, so much in the legislation that so many of us have been working, um, working towards. There's tremendous um, new funding and resources and structures being created around um, community input, health planning, um, workforce development in the healthcare area, culturally competent care. So there, there really um, is, an, is a chance for major impact, if not really revolutionary change. Um, how do I feel about the bill altogether? Exceedingly disappointed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it'll fail um, fundamentally to af affect the, the funding crisis in the healthcare system and in our economy altogether. I think the you know, the key design, policy design um, opportunities that were missed are, are much more significant than some of the good stuff that made it through. I mean, I think it'll help a lot of people, particularly people who are really low income. I think it creates, um, you know, uh, my personal opinion is it looks a little bit like a trillion dollar transfer of taxes from people like us to the insurance industry in order to cover, you know, 15 million more people with private insurance. Um, 
and, and 15 million people in Medicaid. Um, and so I'm all for people having that coverage, but it, I don't think it's really gonna affect the cost of care. And then on the issue, part of my bitterness is that I spent the last year working on um, immigrant inclusion in health reform, and that issue was handled so poorly by Democrats, and it, it didn't even really require much demagoguing by Republicans in order to create really, really bad policy in that area, and so I think we'll be, we're, we're gonna face structural funding um, problems throughout the healthcare system in coming years as a result of that, so very disappointed on, on that particular account. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Padmore, could you respond to what, Admore, uh, what, what Adam just said, specifically because you did mention hospitals closing uh, as well, and you do work in government. <laughs> yeah. But I don't blame you for health care. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Um, I, 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 there's a lot that, that can be said that, had, that was not met in the new bill. Um, and at the same time, there's always, uh, there's, uh, there are always opportunities that are gonna be presented, presented themselves. Um, yeah, there is a significant shift, at least from what we are seeing away from hospitals to primary care, which hopefully, um, you know, there's a, uh, you know, we have just, uh, it always put bills and with the, with the intent of, of having an, a, policy, a, a policy to have specific outcomes. And it's really about people trying to make these outcomes happen. Um, you know, it's, unfortunately it's not, it's not a great bill, but it's something that we have and you have to work with. One thing that I would suggest, like for, you know, all those, the students here is to keep informed on that by going to um, various publications that do kind of dissect a lot of stuff. One very good one is Health Affairs. It's really good, it's a really good um, agenda of what's happening and breaks down a lot of stuff so you can really get a good idea of what is in and what is not in there, but you have to keep up in the field um, so you know what's going on. Um, yeah, you know, there is a, signifi a sig significant shift because one of the big issues is that, you know, hospitals, they're big. Um, I mean, one of the, like we, in my, my position, I deal with every single hospital in New York City. And as I said, some of them have closed down. The largest, um, the largest system is New York Presbyterian. New York Presbyterian is practically a, a corporation. I mean, they have hospitals in, in um, the Middle East. Yeah. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, and you're dealing, with, you're dealing with organizations that are gonna try and reap as much as possible as, that they can from this. At the same time, they're gonna, there's gonna be, you know, small moms and pops Docs, one, two docs that are out there that are ex, you know, expecting to see, hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more patients. Hopefully we'll be getting a good Medicaid um, 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 reimbursement rate or Medicare reimbursement rate from this. And being able to help me, this is an opportunity that's really there. Break this down to various physicians, how you can um, take advantage of it. Break it down to nonprofit organizations that are looking to expand their social services to, um, to, in this field. So these are opportunities that are there. Um, you know, Adam, you know, he works on, on the end where you're, he's seeing specifically what's happening. I'm kind of on the other side, mm -hmm. and, which is, you know, it's good to have on, on both sides. So I think he's going to be seen a, having a lot more disappointments um, on his end. I'm, I'm going to say that there's going to be disappointments on my end, but I think that when I can, you know, we're trying to get save 100 people and we can, and, Previously, we were saving zero, but now we're saving 10. That's 10 more. At least we can say, you know, hey, we, we, we've, we devised a way of saving 10. We have to just keep on I'm putting it together to try and save another 10 and another 10 and another 10. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's the way we have to do it. You know, you have to you know, take baby steps to, to reach a, a, mile, a milestone. Um, but, you know, definitely, there, you know, and another thing, big thing is, and this is a double-edged sword, definitely is um, electronic health records. That is gonna be prevalent. Um, it's, 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 it's a heavy load because it's expected, uh, it's expected that the institutions are gonna be putting up the costs to, um, to bring these, this, this, this equipment and everything else into the fields, but they're not particularly the one that's gonna be benefited from it. And pretty soon, 
um, unless you have this particular type of equipment within your in your institution, you're not you will be losing out on funding from from the government because of not having that. It's great. It's gonna you know um, in terms of, of, of paperwork, it's gonna make it a little bit more efficient, improve care. That's great. But at the same time, there's a lot of issues that I don't think have been properly considered in terms of. Um, uh, um, Patient information just being moved around. That's that's a big issue, and I don't think it's been necessarily being paid carefully enough attention to. So I'll leave that there. There's a we can talk more about that later. It's a touchy subject. Thank you, Padma. Uh, Karen, uh, the specific way I'd like to frame this for you is: you showed tremendous excitement about the healthcare reform bill. So what would you say in response to the healthcare reform bill in terms of the challenges or the opportunities it offers for students over the next decade? Well, <clears throat> my glass is almost always half full. <laughs> so I know there are some disappointments about the health reform uh, bill, but I think it is, as Padmar says, a step in the right direction. And it's a tremendous investment in a field of, um, that, that, ha that will generate a lot of opportunities for uh, new positions and, and really the opportunity to solve some of these problems and to shape some of the implementation of, of these new regulations, of these new opportunities, of these new funding streams. I mean, if you look at just the federally qualified health center funding stream, right now it's about two plus billion dollars a year is, are, is spent on on about 1,200 community health centers around the country. This bill doubles that. So there, there, there are dollars, and I'm not sure exactly where they're coming from, and I know that's kind of an issue <laughs> for our country, but there, there, there's a doubling of resources um, coming down the path um, to increase primary care in communities all around this country. That's a lot of jobs. It's a lot of career opportunities, and they're, the implementation of these new health centers are going to require creativity and, and, uh, and you know, provide an opportunity to design good quality health care that, that, that meet needs in, in communities all around our country. And there's going to be a great need for health, good health management. Um, I think, frankly, uh, in a lot of different areas, you know, you see about, you know, you are looking for kind of uh, career opportunities in, in health care, and you, you see nursing and doctors and, you know, financial people. You, you don't, there's often not a category of health administration mm -hmm. or health management. And even, I have this bone to pick with my husband who's involved in emergency preparedness now, that in emergency preparedness, they don't ask for volunteers in management. And I, I think that's, that was one of the key things that went wrong in some kind of response, for example, in Katrina. Mm -hmm. They had hundreds, thousands of doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. And how many managers were there? Very few managers. Mm -hmm. I kept saying, put more managers in there so these doctors will have a place to go and there's an organization and a structure and a plan and that people will know what to do, you know? So I think management is one of the most important you know, areas of expertise to bring to a growing, you know, an important um, area um, of, of care, of work, and that type of thing. And, and just, you know, just in New York City, not so I don't want people to be too depressed, it's, <laughs> it's the, the, the hospitals, the number of hospitals have closed, but the number of jobs has, re has stayed the same or grown, even during the recession. The number of healthcare positions in 2009 increased by two, almost three percent. So it is a shifting from inpatient to outpatient. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a move. So, you know, if you're going to choose and you have some options, you know, I, I, I would recommend, you know, staying in the ambulatory outpatient arena, lots to do with EHR and lots to do with growing opportunities to develop these health services. Karen, thank you very much. Uh, Pat Moore, uh, there's a specific question here, which is, uh, as an urban policy student completing 
her required courses, what type of electives would you suggest one take if one were interested in entering either one of your fields? The question is addressed to Padmore and Karen. What, what would you say are some electives, Padmore? You can invent one if you, if you wish. Yeah, sure, I would love to. Yeah, definitely, I would definitely, I'd definitely um, go for the, the uh, um, healthcare finance. But there's also one, I, I remember a course I took, and I think it was healthcare in the community. And I think that's a pretty good class because it really breaks it down, especially in, in New York City. Um, what are the most, the most influential and the most ef um, effective ways of addressing some of the healthcare um, problems that we, that, that we are facing right now? And it's diverse. You know, we have immigrant populations that are not um, seeking care, that are not um, meet, meeting, getting adequate care. Um, you know, that we have, you know, these issues where like H1N1, this up and coming um, new things that we have no idea about. And there, there are gonna be other types of um, um, contagious diseases that are just gonna be breaking out like that too. So it's not, it's, that's not the end of it. Uh, but you really do have to know, you know, you have to have a passion for your community, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, just to be, to be able to, to have that, that need to go and walk around in your community, but to and it, it's it's diverse. You can just walk from you know from Harlem to the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side, and it's, it's different needs for those different communities. So you really have to know. But I definitely think that one class that I, I really appreciated was healthcare in the community. Padmore, thank you. I'm going to ask Karen a question and then leave the remaining minutes for two, two, for one question which I'll be asking Adam and Yolanda. Karen, <laughs> what did a graduate degree add to a mid-career successful individual? <laughs> this is the question addressed to you. Credentials. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> no, uh, it's true. I had a lot of experience um, in healthcare and healthcare management before I got my graduate degree, but I, I felt it was important for me to have, uh, have that credential as I progressed in my area and my level of responsibility. And I'm, I'm probably, and certainly, you know, to compete, um, it wasn't so relevant to me because of, you know, I, I was in my own organization and, and um, you know, able to, to progress just, you know, because of my abilities and whatever. But, um, you know, for most people who do move from, from position to position, you, you, you lose your competitive edge if you don't have a master's degree. It does add some additional information to, you, to your, you know, range of experience and, and background. And, you know, it, it gave me some new uh, information to, to, to use. Um, and also, you know, it gives, it's an outside measure of your willingness to continue to learn mm -hmm. um, and grow in the field. So, you know, I've had people ask me, you know, big donors actually, um, you know, yes, you're entrepreneurial and you were able to put this organization together and have you continue to, you know, increase your, your, your formal knowledge of the field to make sure that you're ready for, you know, the problems and challenges that are going, you're gonna be facing in the future. So for me to be able to say yes <laughs> was the right answer to that person. And, you know, so that, it's important. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Yolanda and mm -hmm. Adam, I'll, these are actually composite questions, so let me see if I can state them clearly. What do you look for in job applicants in terms of skills as opposed to passion? Uh, a second part of this question is, where do you think management policy jobs in health will increase most and least? CMS is already hiring many more and much faster than historically CH, C Health has. That's e a second. E Health. E health. E <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, so those are the two parts of the question. So the question I would then frame is this. What do you look for in job applicants in terms of skills, and where do you think the jobs will be in the future? Yolanda, would you like to start? I don't really hire people in my job. <laughs> so, so let, okay, let me imagine that I am looking at um, resumes and, and trying to hire uh, for, you know, for jobs in, in the foundation world. Um, specifically um, for foundations, I would say you know, knowledge and experience in the nonprofit sector um, and not necessarily paid experience um, because I think for people making the transition from the for-profit world to the nonprofit world, 
uh, and possibly philanthropy, uh, volunteer experience is, is really valuable, um, you know, in, in several different areas of nonprofits, whether it's direct service, whether it's administration, um, fundraising is really valuable. Um, so I would say those things, um, obviously education, um, very important. And also um, a wide range of experiences, I think is really valuable and sets, um, sets potential job applicants apart from, from others. Um, I would leave it at that. And as far as uh, jobs in, in healthcare, you know, Karen, you stated it uh, earlier, uh, community health centers. I think that's a really um, great place to look and, you know, not just in health management, but also um, in, uh, I think, uh, the fundraising aspect, grants management, I think that's really important because um, since all this federal funding is, is being directed toward community health centers, you have to know how to tr get your hands on that money um, to support uh, community health care services. Could you state the question again? Yeah, of course. Uh, essentially, two parts of it. What, what do you think are the skills needed in people applying for jobs? Mm -hmm. And where do you think the jobs will be in the future? So I haven't hired a ton of people, but a few. Um, and I think a good cover letter is really important, um, like a, a boilerplate cover letter or one that's not really mm -hmm. um, connected to the job is is a guarantee that I'm not going to um, have an interview with that person. Um, a coherent resume, although that's not really the most important thing, I think the content, so what people have done is really important. And I've, I have hired people who didn't have specific content expertise or, um, or work experience with the particular skill set that I was hiring for, but if it if it was clear from what they had done and what they were saying that they wanted to do, um, that they would, that I felt like there was a reasonable chance they, they would be well positioned to get the work done in a highly effective way, then that, that was important to me. Um, I, I mean, I guess that's the question, which is if you're doing a cold call as opposed to networking or something like that. Um, so I think the question also was about passion versus skill. And I, I think skill, I, you know, it doesn't matter how passionate someone is if they're not able to handle the complicated dynamics that, that you have to manage at a, at a really uh, mature level in, in a lot of the work. So um, I would take someone who was really competent and motivated and, and dependable and consistent over someone who was really passionate but might not um, show up and get the work done in, in the way that's needed. Uh, where the jobs are, yeah, there's, there's enormous um, funding in healthcare reform for direct services, but also there'll be a need for people to conceptualize programs and administer programs there, uh, with community health workers. Um, there's enormous outreach and enrollment assistance components. There's gonna be a need for people to design and redesign um, the insurance exchanges and the screening and enrollment and application processes and then all of the IT, the back end work of, um, of managing the flow of information. And so I think people who understand um, health management and nonprofit management are gonna have, uh, you know, I think we'll see a limited amount of, of new jobs in the next year or two, but assuming that stuff doesn't get rolled back, you know, four or five years from now, there may be um, enormous new areas uh, um, for people to, to go into work in. Adam, thank you. Uh, they, I, I'm tempted to keep asking questions, but I do wish to leave time aside for all of you to meet, meet each person. So I'd like to conclude this segment, and I'd like to conclude it by saying that I, I, I can't tell you how incredibly moved I am to be here and hear these experiences. As a faculty member, it redeems in many ways the many hours of dry reading we do to prepare for classes, as well as glossy PowerPoint slides which we bring out now and then, and makes us recognize uh, two separate things. First, our obligation as teachers to ensure that those who leave Milano are equipped with the right sets of skills, but at the same time open to the so sorts of experiences that help them acquire 
the different types of expertise. And secondly, also recognize how important it is, the kind that the mission that the new school has and that Milano has, as Lisa was telling us earlier, uh, is embellished and embodied in different ways by the four people who have spoken today. So I really must thank you for a blend of passion, exper exper experience, expertise, and an ability to bring all of it out to the people here. Thank you very much.